So for those who do not know me, I am Bonnie Bird, uh, the executive director at the Waukesha County Historic Society and Museum. Uh, and I, uh, we've created this series of property research workshops, one a month uh, here this late spring and, and summer uh, in support in large part of the upcoming Waukesha Unlocked event in October. Uh, the city of Waukesha this year is celebrating their 125th anniversary. Uh, we at the Historic Society and Museum are hosting a special exhibition, 100 Objects for the History of the City uh, since 1896. Uh, and this workshop series was also really born of our working with the city last year in planning. Uh, they knew they wanted to do something that would highlight the properties, historic properties, and buildings around the city. Uh, and so I said, you know, we've we've got some knowledge there and we've got some resources we may be able to share. Uh, so do want to uh, recognize the city for their support in helping bring these workshops to life. Uh, but even if you're not part of Waukesha Unlocked, there certainly are a number of reasons you might uh, find benefit from a property research workshop uh, like this. Uh, so my goals are to provide help, uh, whether you're conducting original research on a property or a business or a private residence, uh, even if that's say a duplex or an apartment building or a multiple uh, unit type structure. Uh, there are history in those buildings as well. Uh, so with that though, identifying resources for that information this evening, we're focusing most explicitly on maps, city directories and census records. Now, each of those could be complete deep dive courses onto themselves. So I'm gonna try and balance both an introduction to those materials, but also some, some practical knowledge working with them as well. Uh, so long as my internet keeps cooperating here, hopefully we'll be able to pull up some websites uh, and I'll show you how to gain access to those, especially in the last year uh, where so many research centers, our own included, had limited hours or very restricted hours, if not closures, our online resource uh, kind of library or, or access to online resources really has grown uh, quite a bit. Um, one of the other things though that property research can also output are tours and programs uh, that, that you can get, whether you're involved with an organization or something like Waukesha Unlocked. Uh, and, and ultimately that's one of our goals with these series is a successful Waukesha Unlocked event here in October. But again, other other reasons that you might be looking to document kind of listed out there, there are any number. And in our research center at the Warsaw Historic Society and Museum, all of these come up uh, for us routinely. We've got someone joining us here, so we'll get them in. Um, but there are a variety of reasons. Uh, curiosity, uh, I think, is perhaps uh, the underlying for all of them, though. Uh, humans are curious creatures. We like to know about the places that we live, why they are the way they are. Why is it that in the city of Waukesha, there is a preponderance of limestone structures? When did those start dominating that Main Street downtown corridor, especially along the Five Points versus Milwaukee Cream City brick or a red brick or a frame wood structure. Uh, so all of those questions are, are some of the types that can be answered uh, through property research. Uh, and I also include documentation. Equal to conducting research is documenting as you go. Uh, without that documentation, and I am guilty of this as a researcher, you find resources, you get into the archive, you're starting to pull information and you don't write it down or you don't create a good citation page and you don't know where you found things. Um, and learning about what those resources are is very helpful to that documentation. There are a number of things that uh, property history can tell us. And, and one of the things that uh, will come up in each of the, each of our, our workshops is an idea of what is it, what is the output for property research? Um, and, and how do you go about formulating research questions that help you get at, at 
the research in a more effective way. Um, so understanding what property history can tell us is an important first step there. So it's the story of what the property is to today, is to today how and why it's designed, what has been constant, as well as what has changed over time, what events have happened in a space, when they occurred, kind of where in space they would have occurred, uh, and who's responsible. Um, so some of the things, like I was just saying, material choices uh, in a location, uh, buildings that hosted uh, large parties on a third story might have a certain type of spring floor that would have made them a bit bouncier. And so those architectural details blend in with the history of, of use of space uh, in really interesting ways and help space come alive. So three, there are really three things that I always try and approach property research with, uh, kind of my fundamentals, so that when I inevitably am frustrated by something, uh, I kind of fall back on one of these three things. And they co-mingle. One doesn't necessarily have to come before the other, uh, but it's defining the work. So those are your research questions. Uh, the resources, finding the resources, where those resources are, repositories like uh, our organization, the Waukesha Historic Society, or the the State Historic Society, or local libraries, or the UW library systems, or the Library of Congress. So what are those repositories? And we're going to talk about some of those here this evening, uh, and specific collections within those repositories that hold really good resource. Uh, and then to what those resources are. Again, tonight we're going to focus very much on map resource, on city directory, uh, and on census. Um, but within, within each of those, there's kind of of, uh, many avenues that you can pursue underneath any of those three kind of broad material types. And then finally, and I've already said it, documentation, recording the history. Uh, that documentation really is a key part of this process uh, because it helps you keep sense of the other the other things, what your research questions are, what it is you've been looking at. Uh, and it also gives you a sense of purpose in the research. Uh, what is it that you're documenting all of this for? There's not always a city anniversary with a special event happening uh, to give you an output. Um, documentation in and of itself can be that output and help give you that motivation. Uh, I will also say, and this is something that we always share with researchers who come in to our space, uh, connecting with local historic societies and helping to contribute to the record keeping that we do. Uh, for us, we have the Landmark Magazine. That's our quarterly publication. We are always welcoming new authors to join uh, that core of folks for Landmark Magazine. Uh, so publishing as an output, or maybe you want to share something for a family reunion. Uh, all of that work is documentation as well. Uh, the other thing I always tell researchers to keep in mind though, is that research is impressionist painting as an analog, that if you zoom into any one thing, it's a lot of very fine detail and very specific things, and it might not make a lot of sense until you continue to add more and more and more and develop new questions and do more research and document until you have an output that makes sense. Um, so it is the amalgamation of a lot of work, a lot of patience, uh, and a lot of collaboration with other researchers, with colleagues or friends or volunteers in a research center, librarians, archivists, uh, all helping to build what that final piece is going to look like for you. I did want to spend some time here at the top. If you do not already have good habits around research notes, again, documentation is one of my key themes, even though we're talking about resources. Figure out how it is you want to start keeping notes when you're approaching a property research project. Um, whatever works for you is going to be the best method. There is no one size fits all or industry standard. Uh, I certainly through the years and even depending on what it is I'm researching have different approaches. Uh, my go to though when I'm in an archive is a little steno notebook like this. I love them. My house is full of them. My desk is stacked with them. Uh, and I tend to dedicate a, a notebook for each project. Right. That way I'm not flipping through notes unrelated to a, a specific property. I don't want to jump from property research to uh, 
Cow County USA research to uh, tomorrow evening, I'm giving a program on beer and brewing history in the region. So I don't want all those commingled. So everything in my world, every research topic gets its dedicated notebook uh, so that I can I can keep contiguous uh, ideas on what where my research is going, what my sources are, when I go on an archive visit, I put the repository I'm visiting top of page and then start listing out sources, uh, which is another key thing in your research noting process, maintaining that list of sources, uh, because nothing is more frustrating than having a really perfect piece of information and wanting to go back and check it and not knowing where it came from, or sharing your work with a family member or a patron at your business and you know sharing this detail and they say, oh, I want, would love to find out more about that. and you can't help get them to where that information is coming from. Uh, it's just a very frustrating feeling. So keep that list of sources. I've added kind of some of the key uh, points of information that you want to keep with a source. Uh, you don't have to, you know, look up MLA or Chicago style and be perfect. Certainly, if you are looking to certain publications, they might ask you for that. But for most research, uh, when you're doing something like Waukesha Unlocked or even for our landmark magazine, title, author, publication, uh, date, publisher, and the repository where it lives uh, is fairly sufficient. Uh, and the other thing too, finding multiple sources. Go back into source, go back into repository, find multiple sources. Part of that research noting, uh, process though is developing a research question. Uh, some of you guys may have already been thinking about this as it as it comes to property research, uh, but if you haven't, just some jumping off points here. Uh, one of the thing, first things to do is document what you know. Um, and, and we say this to researchers when they come in to work with us, whether it's property or genealogy, right now you are the expert on whatever it is you're researching, even if you don't think you know anything, you know more about it than we do uh, as you walk in the door uh, because you have a sense of, okay, what it is or when in time am I curious about it or what maybe happened there that I wanna know more about. So as it relates to property research, these are some good kind of jumping off questions that you may already have the answers to. Uh, and sometimes understanding and, and listing out what you know in order to come to what it is you're really looking for is one of the most important first steps. And from there, listing out specific questions where your gaps are. Uh, or, and again, some jumping off questions that often uh, come up in our research practice, uh, things like getting at specific construction dates, or maybe there's been additions and trying to understand dates around theirs, uh, understanding generally architectural styles, um, excuse me, uh, prior owners. And really each of these questions uh, we treat uh, as what I'm gonna call a plumb line. So kind of a, a straight line that as researchers, we can follow that plumb line, that specific question through the various resource types, through the maps, through the city directories, through the census records, so that if we're looking for prior owners, we know we're looking for people through those records that we want to get at that information versus say architectural style uh that is a is a separate plumb line whereas we go through those same resources we're going to be looking for different details or different information as it relates to understanding the architectural style history uh, of a of a structure um so again documenting what you know listing that out and then listing the specific questions that get at what you don't know or what you want to find more about. Uh, I, I always, you know, any any educator or, or, you know, researcher will tell you there's no bad questions, but there are better questions. Uh, it can be very difficult when when someone reaches out and says, give me everything you have on this address or right. It's too big of a question having that focus, having a bit more specificity will actually make the material, the archive materials and, and resources more accessible, not less. Because whomever is helping you, a librarian, an archivist, a research assistant, uh, they're going to have a better sense of, of material types based on a specific question. Those give me everything questions in, in our minds, we go, 
we've got several thousand things that could help answer that. And we know you don't want a pile of several thousand things in front of you. Uh, so, so it's helping to manage that research process too. And we love frequent flyers, right? Come back into the archive, uh, for as many visits as it takes to get through the information. And we also, through a specific question, are better able to understand where our archive limitations might be and get you in touch with where the next good repository is or right where that next connection point is for you to find the next information. So with that, I will get into our first resource of the evening, maps. Uh, I'm going to focus most specifically on Sanborn fire insurance maps and then plat maps and atlases. There are certainly other map types, uh, and, and I don't want to ignore them entirely. But again, based on our practice in, in our archive and research center, Sanborn maps and plat maps and atlases are the most used when it comes to property research requests, especially those Sanborn fire insurance maps. Uh, and just a quick uh, kind of overview for those two groupings, if you're not familiar, Sanborn fire insurance maps do refer to a particular company that published those. Uh, as their name implies, they were for fire insurance purposes. Uh, the Sanborn company was based out of New York, but they were one of the most prolific companies across the country. They produced uh, highly detailed maps for more than 12 thousand cities and towns and municipalities across the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So they really covered North America and covered a period uh, most explicitly from the late 19th century into the early 20th century. So right during a kind of 40, 50 year period where you see a huge expansion of towns and cities across the United States, massive growth and redevelopment uh, certainly, that's part of the city of Waukesha story uh, and some of the other towns in our area where we had a first wave of settlement and development from 1840 to the 1890s. And then you have a new generation in that turn of the century moment that's redeveloping some of those areas. We have uh, trains that have remade what our transit lines look like. We have the beginnings of electric rail starting to come through. Uh, you have the first kind of inklings of public utilities uh, starting to come into spaces. And all of those are changing the landscape and altering what our structures are looking like. So Sanborn is on the ground uh, with agents creating these maps and doing, again, incredibly detailed uh, work to the types of structures being built because they're making these on behalf of insurers on the ground. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about Sanborn maps here in just a second. Uh, but the other than those plat maps and atlases I've, I've grouped together, uh, they are uh, often in the 19th century uh, completed by private uh, uh, cartographers or surveyors, or they're made based on uh, survey notes that are held by a, a municipal office. And their goal, uh, plat maps as well as an atlas, is largely is to document the shape and ownership of specific uh, land, uh, so attractive land, as it were. Um, they illustrate uh, based on the legal description of the land. Uh, so if you've ever come across either on tax assessment or if you have uh, something like this tucked away, this is the an abstract of title for a home where it'll say a property description that reads something along the northwest quarter of the northeast quarter of section three township 17 range, eight, that type of description. That's the description that plat maps are often using as their baseline and what they're trying to represent. Uh, by the last uh, quarter of the 19th century, uh, many of those were beginning to be published in book form. Uh, and so you'd often see those individual pages now in antique malls that have been framed, or you'll see the sections of the specific town or city maps that have been those pages that have been framed now for sale. I know we've had some in our gift shop. Uh, I'll also see them on the walls in real estate agent offices uh, or in, in municipal offices in the area. So again, 
other maps beyond those, but in terms of property research and kind of the most impactful resources to start with, this is where we typically start with researchers coming into our space. So again, Sanborn fire insurance maps are what we're gonna start with and we're gonna spend some time with them uh, because again, they're incredibly uh, valuable. They have a wealth of information that they can provide. Uh, again, looking towards things that are available online that you can access even this evening, if you would like, or in a browser to the side, I won't be offended. Uh, Library of Congress has a uh, dedicated collection of Sanborn fire insurance maps. Uh, I've listed then here the years that are available for Waukesha County. Uh, excuse me, for Waukesha Township. Uh, they are not always uh, equally distributed across the county through time. Uh, so again, with the idea that they're being produced for insurance purposes, they focus on high density cities and towns first. As you see population increase, you do start to see other towns and townships in the county uh, also be included in the Sanborn schedules, but it's not uniform. And as you can see from these dates, uh, for these are specifically for, again, the city of Waukesha, Sanborn maps available at Library of Congress. Uh, they're inconsistent in their publication. So it's not in every five or seven or 10 year schedule. Uh, it's, it's somewhat sporadic, uh, but consistent enough that as you look across the Sanborn maps for each year, you can get a very strong sense of development. Uh, and again, with uh, the idea of, of uh, dense city areas that do have additions being added onto buildings or have structures that are being adapted for better fireproofing, Sanborn is going to capture those changes, even of the material that the buildings are being constructed of. The map page that I have copied here that is out of the 1895 uh, Sanborn fire insurance map. And you can see kind of the color coding and, and the number superimposed uh, over on the map. And hopefully that laser pointer uh, mouse icon's coming through for you. Uh, but each of those numbers corresponds to a page then in the book, the map book uh, that the Sanborn insurance maps were kept in. Um, and so it's not sequential as it lays on the map, but it does then make sense in that book format. The other information that can be found on these cover pages, you can see there's a street index here. The special index then are businesses, uh, retailers, industries, uh, largely again, kind of high points of interest for insurers to be aware of. Uh, the other information you see, uh, population estimate, uh, what's lost in the fine print here are other details relevant, again, for insurance purposes. What does the water utility or the water facilities look like? What are the capacity of the water pipes in the city? Uh, and also then fire department. How many fire departments, how many stations are in a town? What do their pumps or trucks look like? Uh, how quickly can they respond? A lot of detailed information as it relates to uh, the security of structure, as, as it relates to fire risk. Uh, also, they will indicate prevailing wind direction uh, in an area, which can be very interesting uh, as it relates to especially agricultural structures that might be built with wind direction in mind. Uh, so again, a lot, a lot of information embedded in these maps. I want to focus particularly, though, uh, for our kind of highest impact within the city of Waukesha, at least, on the 1922 fire insurance map. And it, this is a, a story that is not unique to us. The house numbering system or the structure numbering system changed. So prior to 1920, 1921, uh, it takes some time to roll this out. Uh, properties within the city had one number, 
and then they were given a new number. And some of that had to do with development, right? As you add new structures, you have to slot new numbers in and, and not enough space was left uh, in the numbering system prior. Uh, and so the 1922 map captures both addresses for a property. So it has both the new address that has carried through time now to the present, as well as the prior address. This is our Rosetta Stone, as it were, at least for property research and trying to overcome uh, that numbering change. Uh, I, I will say when I first uh, came to Waukesha. I'm a transplant uh, from Northeast Ohio and a couple of other states in between. Um, but I didn't, I, everywhere I've lived has had something like this happen in a municipal area uh, or in a rural area that went from having kind of no name streets to now we're going to have street names, right? Uh, and so finding this kind of resource was one of the first really key things to helping me be able to be a better curator and archivist uh, for our community. The other thing I want to highlight on here is the key that's somewhat buried here. So we're gonna pop it out a little bit. So this key is what is very useful then reading across the specific pages and we'll take a look at those in a minute. Um, but how, what the system is for identifying, especially material types for structure. And I think there's some logic. It's a color coded system uh, used on these maps. So it's just below the midpoint uh, here in the key where buildings colored yellow are frame, i.e. wooden frame structure. So kind of yellow tan for wood. Uh, red are brick. Again, Sanborn's out of New York. They're not aware of our cream city coloration. So we'll go with red brick here. Uh, blue for stone, gray for iron, and then brown for fireproof. Uh, and fireproof could be a number of things. Uh, it could be that, that a material was applied, something like asbestos perhaps, uh, as to increase the fireproofing or uh, maybe iron and, uh, and brick combined. Um, so it could be a, a number of things, again, depending on where you are in country and kind of what your structure is. Um, also, other indications provided on the maps, things like windows, uh, if there's firewalling uh, above wood cornice or above partitions, where fire stations are, uh, automatic sprinkler systems, all sorts of really lovely uh, information. So again, if my bandwidth will cooperate with me, I'm going to drag over here. This is the Library of Congress website, loc.gov. And if you go to loc.gov, or even if you type in, because we're a smaller group, I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Everybody keep your fingers crossed. So you can just type in your web browser, loc.gov, and then hit spacebar. And now, at least if you're in a Google supported browser, now you're gonna search on the Library of Congress website. So now I'm going to do fire insurance maps for Waukesha. And hopefully this works. Again, my bandwidth will hopefully keep up with us. Maybe not. There we go. So you're going to see something like this come up. Again, loc.gov, hit the space, Sanborn insurance maps. From here, you can kind of bring that search even more specific. And it looks like I got thrown into a general search for Sanborn maps here. So I'm just going to hit the back since I already had our 1922 fire insurance map pulled up. But Library of Congress has a really lovely interface uh, where you can get really up close and personal with these maps. And so again, it was a little bit easier to see on that uh, 1895 map that I had before. Um, the by 1922 our our city of Waukesha maps a little denser uh so a little bit more going on but uh you can see in red is highlighted what is considered by Sanborn the central downtown area so that's the higher density area that is both commercial purpose retail purpose as well as dwelling um you can see too these circular 
uh, lines radiating out, those are distance from the post office. You've also got, as the roads kind of continue off past the map, indications of nearest then municipal area or nearest large city that they're heading towards, identification of major transit lines, the TMER and L electric line, the railroad, and then not just that it's a railroad, but what company within each kind of page indicated then. You've got the subdivisions identified or additions to town identified. But we are going to jump to one of these specific pages. So as I zoom in here, we've got East Avenue coming up here, up to Main Street across. And I'm going to be selfish because I know on this corner of East and Main is the old courthouse where our historic society and museum lives. So here, and this is why you have the color coding on this page to help delineate where page 10 ends and page nine begins. So I'm gonna to jump to page nine. So you've got the navigation up there, quick jump. One of the things that sometimes throws folks off with Sanborns is that the page does not stay true north. So you might have to turn the page if you want to keep your orientation north going up. So as I zoom in here, East Avenue is now coming in. So north is going off the side of the page to the left. Um, but again, you can see that color coding system that was in the key from that first page. So for our courthouse building, we are that lovely steely blue for uh, our limestone structure. You can see the jail as well, just at the other side of our block. Because this is 1922, our connector building does not exist yet. That didn't come until the 1930s. As we zoom in, and especially for businesses, industrial properties, even retail properties, there's even more detail within the property outline. Now, the Sanborn maps are drawn to dimension, and so you will get uh, dimensional numbering on how tall structures are, um, even on streets, how wide streets are, um, and some indication of what the interior layout is for a structure. So as I zoom out here, and go across Main Street, you can see the structures and their individual lots outlined uh, between Main Street and Baxter. The D, that uppercase D, is an indication of a dwelling structure. Uh, again, you'll see the red indi indicative, indicative, excuse me, of a brick structure when it is, as you see here on these two properties, when it's red, but largely filled with that yellow, that's gonna be brick exterior with then frame within, or in this case, you've got frame porches on the front and back. And so that's that dotted are going to be exterior entry points or porch structures. You've also got indications for wagon sheds versus automobile garages, uh, where you've got on this structure here, stuccoed for finish. Uh, and again, and the reason why I love the 1922 Sanborn map, the two addresses for the properties captured there. So the parenthetical number is the old address and then the current or the new address there below. So again, the Sanborn maps, incredible amount of detail, incredible amount of information. Uh, and they're really, one, I, I enjoy getting lost in resource, uh, but really good resources to get lost in. Uh, the other thing that is really wonderful about those Sanborn maps is that they can help indicate because they're capturing the property lines and outbuildings, if 
uh, outbuildings have moved on a property, if a garage has moved around on a property, uh, or if a carriage barn moved to become a garage uh, and has been repositioned uh, in downtown corridors where you have uh, high or where you have businesses right next to each other, you can see where uh, their development may have affected property line shifting uh, as additions were put on. Um, so again, huge, huge wealth of information to be found. Uh, here was my screen grab of that um, page of the map we were just looking at. Uh, you can see too on this screen grab, it extended a bit up Main Street. Uh, so you've also got White Rock Ave continuing up that direction. Uh, and some really interesting lot lines going on. They're kind of behind where the clock tower apartments are today, uh, where you had that kind of odd shift in the roadway structure to create some of those interesting lines. So again, I, I knew I was going to spend a good amount of time on Sanborn maps, uh, but really tremendously helpful resources, especially as you're starting to delve into uh, your property research. Uh, taking note of those address changes. Uh, we've also had road name changes in the city. Uh, so taking note as the, of those as well. Um, that information though, some of that is also embedded in your plat maps and atlases. Uh, and again, plat maps and atlases uh, generally are based on surveyor notes, are more focused on capturing legal property description and representing those visually. Uh, and so often, you know, they make their way into libraries and historic societies and archives like ours, uh, but also are typically fi filed with the county um, Register of Deeds Office or a county surveyor, uh, engineering department, tax assessors, uh, all of those various uh, municipal functions, uh, all those offices have use for uh, plat maps for atlases based on legal property descriptions. Um, by the 1850s, uh, we you see plat maps being produced. Usually they're very large wall hanging maps for Waukesha County. Our earliest wall hang plat map dates from 1859. Uh, we are very fortunate to have one in our collection. Uh, they, the ones, the other extants that I know of uh, like ours are all very fragile and brittle. And so we are very fortunate that there are several collections of maps that have undergone digitization really for preservation to make uh, those maps more accessible. Uh, one of those repositories besides us uh, is the Wisconsin Historic Society, uh, but also the UW Library System, uh, specifically their Waukesha County History Project from 1870 to 1920. Uh, we actually were a partner on that project along with the library, uh, Waukesha Public Library, uh, capturing not only maps, but also photographic materials uh, to make them available online. Uh, that project, oh, I want to say was 09 to to 11, 2009 to 11, uh, so longer ago now than any of us care to admit. Um, but again, one access point for, and you can see the dates there for Atlas, Platt, and then another Atlas, uh, as well through the UW Library Systems is the uh, collection American Geographic Society Library Digital Map Collection. Very lovely name there. Uh, not just maps related to uh, Waukesha or to Wisconsin, but uh, collect one of actually the best collections in the country uh, for maps uh, throughout the United States uh, held at the UW Libraries. Uh, and they, again, have done a tremendous amount of work to digitize though and those and make those available, uh, especially that 1859, that early map that I mentioned. Uh, and one of the things that plat maps are really lovely for are some of the outlying city areas and capturing those property owners. Uh, you can see here, I've, I've uh, screen grabbed the 1873 uh, Atlas of Waukesha County published out of Madison. Um, in red is uh, the what's considered uh, this edition, kind of the city area that is called out on a separate page then. Uh, but you then still have the whole of the township uh, represented here. Now, 
This is a topic for another program. It's one of my favorite topics, though, is that uh, all of our maps in Wisconsin, uh, our property descriptions are based on the township and range system, uh, which is the fundamentals for the public land survey system that has been in effect uh, since the Continental Congress met to debate how to allocate land to its citizens. Uh, one of my favorite early America history facts coming to affect us even through the present day. Uh, so that description uh, that you'll find in your property abstracts or on your tax assessment that is the quarter, southwest quarter of the northeast quarter of section three, range eight, township 17, that's coming from that public land survey system. So you can thank the founders for that one. Uh, but getting into these maps. A uh, screen grab for you of the 1859. One of the things that I think makes researching property in Waukesha using uh, Platts and Atlas is a little bit easier is that our, our city grid, such as it is, established itself fairly quickly. Um, some of that has to do with the river, also the railroad lines, and then the main waypoints uh, to locations like Waterville and Janesville and Milwaukee, uh, so that you have recognizable grid patterns, even if the street names are different. Uh, and so here you can see coming up, just off the end of my screen grab here was the word East. So we have East Division Street coming up and then Pleasant Street, which is still pleasant. But as you come over, we have High Street, which is not High Street today, it's Hartwell. Temperance Street also does not exist today. There was a temperance society in this in uh, the area in the 1840s, did not last very long, but they had some effects on the landscape. Um, but again, Church Street, not a familiar name to today, but the grid is familiar, right? If I advance here, jumping now to the 1873 map, plat map, or excuse me, Atlas of Waukesha County, again, still street names that are unfamiliar, but that familiar grid pattern that we know. So again, East Division Street here, we've got Hartwell, still High Street here coming down as well. With the plats and atlases, you may have noticed that there are uh, kind of those black dots scattered about the map. Those are fairly true to the primary structure of a property. Unlike the Sanborn that was capturing outbuildings to a very high degree of detail, these are more an impression of the structures that are on property because their primary goal is to capture the property ownership, not the improvement or the structure on property. Uh, so just kind of the, the difference there in what the impetus for the creation of the maps are and, and how we can read them as researchers today. By the 1914 standard atlas, the city is now divided in two sections. So it's a double, double page fold out uh, across four pages total. So this is our northern section. Uh, and then also the southern section of the city. Um, but as we did with the, that's not the one I want, with the Library of Congress site, I was going to pull up, if I can, that one. So this is through the UW Libraries, Waukesha County History, 1870 to 1920. Uh, so as I said, it is photographs as well as document or textual materials, our uh, plat maps and atlases. So if you navigate to this page, you're gonna wanna come down to the right side and click on browse text materials. And there's actually more than just maps here. Uh, and, and you may also feel jarred into a prior version of the internet that uh, was grant funded back in, in 09 uh, or so. And so it feels a little bit 2009 still, but that's okay. Uh, but our atlases, one, I we tend to abbreviate their names in practice, lovely long names here. Uh, but if I pull up, this is gonna be the 1914 
And once you direct here, one, again, to the documentation, the first thing it starts with is here's your source, here's how you document us. And also here's a stable link that you can save to get back to this resource. Uh, from there, the map itself is actually sectioned with direct links into individual sections. And again, this is a county map, unlike the Sanborns that were giving some preference to those higher density cities and towns, the atlases and plats are going to be entire counties represented. Uh, so you can search if you're following property owners uh, that have moved into the city from elsewhere in the county, you could follow their specific family history into where their homestead may have been uh, here in the county elsewhere. Uh, someone like Dr. Margaret Caldwell, who becomes a physician in the city, she's born in Pewaukee. So her narrative, her origins take us out of, of the city maps. Uh, but I'm gonna jump here to the north part of Waukesha, the city. Uh, again, a little bit older navigation as compared to what we saw in the Library of Congress. Uh, so as you come over on the left navigation, there are these three different page kind of rectangles. Those are your page sizes you can view. So if you pop all the way up in that page size, now you get that enlarged view rather than zooming in like you could with Library of Congress. Uh, but you have indication of city limits here as we scroll down. And now the names of the property owners make themselves a bit more apparent. As we get into the density of individual lots in some of the additions, you can see that we lose that level of detail um, in this map. Uh, and that is one of the limitations of plat maps is that as they get into those higher density areas, they do lose some of the detail. And this gets to needing a multitude of sources to get at what it is we're researching. From these maps though, again, still a high level of information with regard to how cities are development, understanding where development lines are, where subdivision lines are, railroad exchanges as well, um, how roads cut through, where major industries are located. So Wilbur Lumber Company here along the Fox River indicated. So even though we don't have that Sanborn level detail of what exactly their facility looks like, we've still got knowledge of what, what industries are located and what their proximities are to neighborhoods. Um, a lot can be said for understanding a surrounding area for a property as it may have impacted what's happening at your your specific property you're researching um, right that one of one of the examples that should be captured here is the strand neighborhood and i might be just off the map but the strand neighborhood one was a, a high immigrant neighborhood throughout the 20th century and part of that had to do with its proximity to the industries uh, that were along the fox river um, and so making those connections things like the plat maps and atlases are really incredible resources for those so again coming to this through uw libraries Waukesha County history, 1870, 1920, and then jumping into the textual materials. The photograph collection is also lovely to get lost in, um, but it's a bit more eclectic as opposed to the map collection or the textual collection that had a number of resources. And again, there are certainly other maps that I am not going to get into in depth here this evening, uh, but things like bird's eye view maps, I've got a, a capture of a portion of a map here. They do include not just really, I think really beautiful views of a city, there will be street names embedded. Often key points of interest will be numbered or lettered with an index at the bottom. Uh, often those bird's eye view maps were uh, maps that were paid for for marketing around a certain uh, a, a certain new hotel would be coming in, and so they would underwrite uh, the creation of a map 
of a map. Uh, the Fountain Spring House is an example of that uh, in the city of Waukesha. Uh, or railroads would, with passenger service, would help underwrite the cost of a bird's eye view map to make a, a city or town look very appealing. Uh, municipal maps, that's uh, my umbrella term for maps that are coming out of specific city departments or municipal departments. Uh, so that might be engineering, that might be tax assessment. They will generate and create uh, specific maps for their purposes that will also have an incredible amount of information about uh, how a city or how a town functions. Utility companies likewise creating maps that have high level of detail, especially for residential service. Uh, in addition, then finally, transportation. Uh, railroads, uh, the TMER and L created maps for their per planning purposes. Bus lines, uh, more recent uh, bus line schedule maps. Uh, have as well as street maps, right? Driving maps have a lot of information about how cities have developed more recently then. Uh, so all of those incredibly valuable resources to read in tandem with these more historic map resources then. So with that, I will pause if anyone has any thoughts or questions or wants to sneak in a question about a map, I'm gonna rehydrate briefly. I've not seen any questions in the chat. At least I don't think so. All right, you guys are just along for the ride. We'll keep going. So with all the information that, that maps can give us, what they didn't give us at least well were the names of the people living in the structures, right? Especially in those higher density city areas. And that's where approaching city directories and then censuses, the last resource we're talking about tonight, uh, these two resources really work in tandem with those maps. Uh, this uh, slide has an overview of the city directories that we hold in our collection uh, in our research center. Uh, and really it's three different publishers that have taken us through time. Uh, the Waukesha County Gazetteer uh, goes for our collection dates from 1875 to 1891. AC Rights Directory is the largest publisher represented in our city directories and, and actually one of the largest city directory publishers for our region uh, were rights directories, almost a century's worth of directories from them. And then uh, Polks picked up after rights. Uh, we do have someone in the chat. Is Are there city directories for other townships like Eagle and Waukesha County? That is a fantastic question. There are not as many as we would like there to be. And this is actually a perfect dovetail into uh, why that is, is the publishers. The publishers are often, in our case, we're actually fortunate that rights uh, was located in Milwaukee. And so in some of the rights directories, there are rural directory inclusions, but they're not truly inclusive of the entire county area for uh, Eagle, Ottawa town as well, um, even Big Ben Vernon area. There are some locally published directories that we look to more frequently. Uh, they are very intermittent though. Uh, the other thing though with those areas, at least when we're looking for property owners is actually the plat maps. The plat maps are very strong for identifying property owners. Um, now for farms that hosted uh, hosted laborers. We have less access to information through city directories for that. Um, but circling back to your initial question, are there are there directories for townships like Eagle? Not from from these major publishers, no. The, the publishers here treat them as inclusions to the larger municipal or city or town that they're they're making the publication for. And part of that is because they're publishing by soliciting ad revenue uh, 
from the businesses in the region. And so they targeted higher density cities in order to get the ad buys to support the publication. So because the, the towns, Eagle, Ottawa, even Vernon, uh, or even Menominee Falls, when we're, when we're talking kind of turn of century and, and even young 20 or first half of the 20th century, because the perception is that the ad revenue isn't there, they're not as actively canvassed. Um, and that's the term the publishers use. They send out their own agents, their own canvassers to collect the information, which also leads to uh, some inaccuracy, unfortunately, where they're not looking at census records or they're not looking at, at tax rolls or anything like that or any kind of official record to compile these. They're independently canvassing. Uh, so if somebody is at home, they may not be included. Or if a neighbor answers on your behalf, hey, who lives in that house? And they say, oh, well, Lee lives in that house, but that's my nickname. My name is Bonnie. I might get lost in the record that way. Um, and so there, there are some shortcomings to those city directories and, and the inclusivity factor is definitely one of them uh, as, it, as it applies to suburban rural as well as other factors. So hopefully, even though it's not a satisfactory answer, answered your question. In terms of what information we can get out of city directories, because they can be very, okay, good. Because they can be incredibly useful. Um, at the baseline, again, I always like breaking things down into what are, what are the kind of smaller parts that I can approach this with. You'll have a resident index, an index by street, and then a business listing, those classifieds, right? So with the resident index, name, address, and occupation. Uh, An occupation can be one that is incredibly useful if you're trying to track someone through time or, and, and make sure it's the right person, or if you're looking at a business address and you have a sense of an owner, but you're not clear on what the business type was. As you look in the city directories and see what their occupation listed is, it can help inform you what was happening in that business, right? Or if there was more specificity to what type of business was being conducted. Uh, so we're going to take a closer look at an ex a couple example pages for each of those kind of section types. Uh, so this is the 1899 rights directory for Waukesha City, uh, although Right off the bat, you might notice that one of these people doesn't even live in the city of Waukesha, Gail E. O. So last name followed by first initials. Uh, president of the White Rock Mineral Spring Company, residence Chicago. So again, major uh, advertisers or uh, leaders, business owners would, could be included even if they were not residents of the city. But I've got a couple others I wanted to zoom in on. Uh, this entry comes from the very bottom of the page. Galt Francis H, uh, flower and feed at 111 Broadway East. Uh, RES Res 208 McCall. So with this entry, the first is his occupational listing. He works at the Flower and Feed at 111 Broadway and his residence, RES is that abbreviation, is at 208 McCall Street. So again, a lot of embedded information. In this example, we've got two separate addresses, but looking for that residence abbreviation, the address following that is gonna be a residence as opposed to the preceding address. A bit further up the page, uh, zooming in on Nancy Gallagher, there were a number of Gallagher's there to choose from. Uh, you can see in this case, uh, Nancy Gallagher, uh, I've highlighted at the top there, the widow of Daniel in that parathetical. This, again, city directories can be a really good source for uh, getting that type of information, that type of vital record information, uh, and actually seeing women uh, kind of rise as the primary uh, resident listed. Uh, oftentimes, women's names would be omitted from a directory until the point that they were widowed. Um, 
So interesting to see that residence 225 Main Street East. Uh, you can also see uh, two below, uh, Galatin Maggie Galatin, I apologize if I've mispronounced her name, uh, a domestic uh, at 105 McCall. So two city directories, because of the occupational listing, are an incredible way to find folks who are working in in industries or areas that are, are otherwise difficult to capture their stories um, in a space where she's working as a domestic, whether that's a housekeeper or a servant of some kind in the house at 105 McCall Street. Uh, and the last one uh, that I pulled up here, not from this page specifically, but I kind of mentioned this a moment ago, is the disclaimer with regard to how some, of, some folks might be omitted or information missed. The information is as accurate as they can make it, right? They're sending out their private canvassers. Um, they want you to tell them if they are inaccurate, they will correct it immediately. Um, but it is, there, there absolutely are inaccuracies, misspellings um, in a home that has multiple siblings. One of the siblings may disappear out of a year of the directory and then reappear in a year later. Um, so, and, and that can simply be error in the canvassers uh, work. Uh, there are generally though, with some of those abbreviations, there is a page typically at the beginning of that alphabetic listing uh, that gives you what those abbreviations are. And so I've got grabs of two abbreviation pages here, uh, one from the 1899, and we were just looking at a page from that, uh, and also then one from 1945. Uh, one of the things that is always very apparent to me looking at this is just the development of diversity uh, of occupation, uh, what folks are doing that is being recorded, uh, kind of how much more, how many more layers of information uh, there are by 1945 in terms of what folks are doing. The other really interesting capture in the 1945, <coughs> excuse me, you see abbreviations for US or USA, United States Army, USMC, United States Marine Corps, USN, United States Navy. By 1945, Wrights is making sure to capture military service information as well. So someone may still be listed as an owner at a property or a resident at a property, but they're also gonna make the inclusion of their service that they may not be present at that physical location. And here's why. So again, a tremendous amount of information that, that can be found in those directories. So from the alphabetic listing by person, you also have a street index. Uh, and again, incredibly powerful uh, uh, section of the city directory. And with the street index, it's alphabetical by street and then numeric along the street listing either the owner or the resident. Uh, you can also see on the page I've copied here, you've got where other roads intersect. So it really gives you a, a descriptive picture of what the physical street looks like, right? Uh, the other lovely uh, uh, icon from here, and this is the 1945 directory, you can see a bell listed with some of them. They have a telephone. Uh, so that's that uh, little icon. And then the O that's circled is indicative of an owner of a property there. Uh, and I kind of zoomed in on, on a section of the, of the page here. The other thing then, as it relates to properties that were businesses, or if you're researching a, an industrial property or a, a, a furniture property, whatever it may be, are the incidental advertisements that are included on every single page. And I say incidental, there is uh, typically an index to advertisers within the directory. So you can flip to those specific pages, but another really good way to get more information about a property that may have had a retail or business use is to look at their advertisements in the rights directories. Uh, again, rights is selling ads to help underwrite the cost of production. So every single page has them. If you've looked at a cover of a rights directory, the covers are full of advertisements. Uh, it can actually be a little difficult to find what year uh, a specific directory is from because it's so buried and amongst uh, kind of the visual mess that is the advertisements. Um, 
So another really, really uh, interesting way to get at more information uh, for a business property. And then finally, our yellow pages, right? The classifieds, uh, the business listings. Um, <coughs> Classifieds, of course, because uh, the business uh, listings here are grouped by category or classification. Um, and you could also see a, a subtle hint at uh, why it is you would want to be included amongst the business listing. And this is a buy-in uh, that the, the buyer's guide contains the advertisements and business cards of the more progressive businesses, men and firms in the city classified according to lines of business. So certainly you would want to be of that uh, astir uh, collection of men and firms in the city. So come and, and be part of our classifieds. Um, but again, uh, something like uh, the grocers listings. Uh, some grocers may have have specified uh, in in uh, meat over vegetables, or may have had dry goods as well as as produce groceries. And so, looking through those ads to understand what kind of within a, a business category, what more specifically was that business trading in, um, or for contractors, what was the diversity of of work um, that they were doing that can help inform then specifics that you see in a structure, um, a grocer that was was stocking proteins may have had cold storage in a basement or may have had some type of specialized uh, ice room built at some point before refrigeration was readily available. So that can explain architectural details that you see in a structure. Um, and so, so understanding through the advertisements as related to a business property can, can inform the physical structure of property as well. When it comes to directories, though, and, and digging into them, I did want to share a couple of tips and tricks that I use when I approach them. One is to document, write it all down, uh, write all the former house numbers. Again, we've got those Sanborn maps, so you can kind of compare to make sure things are tracking. Uh, writing down uh, the date of the book you're getting things out of. Uh, so house numbers, street names, and the year that you're getting that information from. All of the people that are listed at the address, right? Even if it's not a name you think you're looking for, write all the names down because it may be that a name comes back or that someone who is boarding in the house is suddenly married into the family. Uh, stranger things have happened. Uh, and, and as well, I'm gonna jump down to the last point there. Uh, what I call my five-year interval trick, don't check every year. Um, when it comes to city directories, again, the rights directories we have from 1891 to 1990, I'm sorry, 1895 to 1991, they are not every single year, but they are most years in that span. So if I'm looking for information related to a property between 1946 and 1970. I'll pull in five-year increments or approximately five-year increments. So I'll pull my my kind of endpoints. I'll pull the 46, I'll pull the 70, and then I'll only pull five-year increments in between and I'll to see if there are changes because it may be for the first 15 years it's the same family living in the house, right? And so now I can look between 1960 and 1970 to see what's changed in that period more explicitly. And even having subdivided from 60 to 65 and 65 to 70, can I get at the more specific change? Um, and that's one way to save yourself a little bit of time uh, when you're first approaching kind of a deep dive into city directories. Um, as, again, thinking of, of Waukesha Unlocked uh, or, or properties that have had businesses and businesses tend to have some legs uh, in the 20th century. There may be ownership changes uh, and, and that though, again, can be more generational than it is every year. Uh, now that's not true for all places. Uh, I, I think there are any number of examples, especially in the last year where there are certain industries that do have a lot of turnover. So it may be worth kind of focusing in on a specific range of years and, and asking 
to pull every single directory. Um, but starting with that five-year interval, again, the analogy to impressionist painting, get get your rough outline of where you need to focus more attention in that period, in those periods, and then start deep diving into those sections. Just cutting yourself self a little bit of, of grace, uh, as it were, in your research. Um, and this gets kind of the last point that I had skipped uh, kind of gets back to the question with regard to the uh, other township directories. Thinking of directories that were created that may not have been published uh, widely like the rights directories were, church directories. Uh, other professional directories, uh, medical uh, professional associations would also public, often publish um, directories of their members, uh, garden clubs, uh, service groups, right? Military, uh, there are, again, intermittent, but military um, directories that have been published by Legion Posts or VFW Posts over time. Um, so looking at those kind of non-traditional publishers, as it were, they may have some of that information that includes not only an individual, but their home address, maybe a home phone number at the time it was published. Um, and so we can take that information and, and get back into some of these other records then as well uh, to get into it. Um, there are some for the larger industries, uh, there are some uh, kind of uh, professional um, type, again, uh, directories that have been published over time or at significant anniversaries for a company where they've done employee directories um, that we can look at as well. Some of those we have in our collections, some of them are yet held by those, those organizations. Um, I've got a, a phone call to return this week actually to a Rotary Club who's looking to transfer their materials into an archive uh, so that they are more accessible. And, and I know part of that collection is going to be prior membership rosters and directories. Uh, and so it's going to increase uh, kind of some of that, that information that we're able to help provide for folks. Um, so, so thinking a little laterally. Um, and I'll say too, this is where making that appointment to come into a research center, come into an archive, talk to the researchers, talk to your, your archivist or li reference librarian. We can help connect those, those various resource points for you and, and help to get at the information if it's not a, a straight line in. Last but not least our census records. Census records have, are, are similar to what uh, we can, or provide information that is similar to what we can get at from a city directory, but are better representative of everyone because they are by their uh, constitutional definition, intended to capture every person, right? Even though they only happen every 10 years, they are going to capture everyone, or at least everyone as, as well as can be done. Um, two, there is more information within censuses if you actually pull and look at the records than, than some folks realize. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at, at one uh, of those here this evening. Um, but there are a couple of different census types, uh, which you all may be aware of. So we've got a federal census that happens every 10 years. We also have a state census that happens every 10 years. Now they're off from each other. So for the federal, it happens in a year ending in a zero. For the state, the year has to end in a five. So ultimately we end up with five-year incremental censuses. Uh, the state census has less information than the federal census. Um, households especially, as you look at some of the older state censuses, it will give only um, the head of household will be named and then it will just give a number for the number of persons in the household. Uh, so that's not as useful sometimes, um, but still you've got those incrementals. And then kind of an overview of, of kind of what the baseline information you can hope to glean from a census. So name, uh, household information, so the number of persons in a household. Uh, on a federal census, the names of each person. Uh, marital status, uh, race, ethnicity, age, occupation. Uh, the other one that I like to highlight though is immigration and migration information. 
uh, throughout the first half of the 20th century, you'll see uh, in the census place of birth for the individual that's being listed, uh, place of birth for their father, place of birth for their mother. Uh, so you can trace migration patterns of people um, and see how different uh, individuals or how different groups have come into uh, certain locations by looking through and tracing some of that information on the census record. So I've just got a couple of grabs from the 1910 census. Uh, I uh, pulled these. Uh, we do hold census records in our collection, um, but I pulled these uh, from familysearch.org. Uh, it is supported by the Latter-day Saints, uh, Church of Latter-day Saints, and they have actually partnered with the National Archives to digitize our census records as they become available um, and make them searchable. Uh, there's a lot of work for transcription there as well. It is a free website to use. Uh, the other reason that I really, really like using Family Search though is that I can get at the primary document. I can see the original digitized capture from the records held by the National Archive, which as a historian, I like my primary sources. Um, but a couple of things to highlight on here, uh, and you can find this information not just on the 1910, also 1900, uh, and I believe 1920 census as well. Um, everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, I think a lot of folks are drawn to start looking at the names and then the relationship within the household. But if you come back left, you'll see we've got streets listed in this first column and then dwelling number or house number right there. So we're on West Main Street, number 106. So we've got our street and we've got our address and now we know the people who are living in that address. And where you see that darkened line from the census taker, now we're on Maple Avenue. We've got the house numbers on Maple Avenue and the residents within, right? Wisconsin Avenue, I've cut off on the screen grab, but Wisconsin Avenue, house number on through. So you've got some address information here in the census record. As you read across the line again, you've got the names coming across, uh, their relative position in the house, so head of house versus, uh, and then typically those underneath are listed by the relation to the head of the house. Uh, so very often you'll see wife following, uh, the first member being her husband, and then their children listed there below. Uh, if there are multiple units in a house, each head of a unit is listed as head. Um, so it's not an indication of ownership, it's kind of within the dwelling unit, as it were, or apartment unit, uh is the head of house um there was uh going across then as i mentioned um here it's the nativity uh a good uh contemporary word for 1910 but it's place of birth of the uh respondent place of birth of the father place of birth of mother uh, and so you can see there's a lot of Wisconsin, a couple of Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, um, but then we get some more diversity of location for place of birth for father and diversity for place of birth, geographic diversity for place of birth for mother. So a really interesting way that you're able to trace that. Uh, it also gives uh, language, first language, um, as well as then occupation uh, and employer. Uh, within that occupation. So we have a plumber who's working at a plumbing shop here. The OA abbreviation is indicative that they are self-employed essentially. That W means they're working for someone, um, but OA is own accord. They are working for themselves or, or under their own investment. And again, just another page from the 1910 census. Uh, as I know I am edging at the extent of my time here. Um, this is the next page though, continuing off of Wisconsin Avenue. Um, again, house numbers, you've got uh, other uh, census uh, tracking numbers related there, family groups on through. Um, for these, whoops, I'm sorry about that coming off of familysearch.org, and as I did with the other resources, wanted to really quick show how to get at this information. 
Uh, so this is familysearch.org. I'm just going to back up here a little bit. So it is a, uh, you do need to sign up with an account. It is free to sign up. Um, once you do, I tend to come up, it does let you build trees and, and, and all of that as other sites do. I tend to go directly to search and then records which brings you to the page I was just on. Uh, and from there, you can browse all published uh, collections. I like to get into a collection. Again, knowing my resource, I'll go into a collection first, like the census records, and then start looking for specific individuals. Um, and so from there, you can control for United States of America, you can even go to a, a state. I will say, though, if you want to look at federal census, don't select Wisconsin because then it's going to filter out federal censuses and give you Wisconsin generated materials. So keep it at that high level and then come down here to collection type censuses and it's alphabetical from there. So you can get down into uh, the Wisconsin census for, or the U.S. census from there and then get into the Wisconsin uh, section of the US whole census. Um, I'm gonna control for my time period. United States, 1919-49 census and lists. And I'm gonna scroll down here to the United States census. Um, so I'm looking for the whole census. Once you're within a specific census, then I'll start looking for the individual or even just a residence area that I want to find. So in this case, I'm going to look for Margaret Caldwell residing in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Because I've already selected, I'm looking at the 1900 census. You don't need to worry about the year range information there. You can really get away just with that. I have, of course, been logged out because I left it logged in for too long, uh, but it will come up. Let's see if it'll let me get at it this way. It will come up then with results based on those search terms. Nope, I've been logged out for an activity. Uh, logged out, uh, but get you into uh, a result that will let you click specifically into then that census record that has that person's name on it you were looking for. Uh, it is not yet indexed to that address information in those first columns. There has been priority to the metadata capture for person's names um, over some of that other. Uh, so I will, if I'm generally doing research on a neighborhood, I will click into the appropriate um, section or if I have one family name from a city directory and I want to follow kind of their neighbors, I'll use that one name as my plumb line into the census and then I'll start browsing through the pages from there, um, looking at who's living around them um, and what those relationships might be or what are the businesses uh, that might be located in this area or the trades, the occupations that folks seem to be sharing in these areas. So bringing it all back as you look at these resource types and again specifically looking at maps city directories census records don't assume too much as you go into them keeping an open mind when it comes to research i am certainly guilty of this where i think i know what it is i'm going to find a little bit or i, I think i understand connections and i'll start looking at resources uh, i'll look at the map i'll look at a census and I'll, I'll have that moment where I have to kind of pull back and say, this isn't making sense to me, but it's because I presumed I knew what I was going to find. Keeping an open mind as you collect the information, document it, then go back and start looking at it more critically. Um, and looking for logical explanations, right? Uh, if you're using family names or if you're following families for ownership history, are there shared first names in a family? Um, my mother's family is one that has five generations of Johns, and we use a lot of middle initials or middle names to help distinguish which generation it is we're talking about. Um, use common sense and arithmetic is the other key there. Uh, look at, on census records, uh, 
age is sometimes a proxy, the age is listed in whole years for adults. So it'll be uh, Margaret Caldwell on the 1900 census, aged 43. Um, but it doesn't capture, did she just turn 43 this year? Is she going to turn 44 this year? Uh, and so if you backwards calculate her birth year, you might be off by a year uh, in either direction. Um, so using arithmetic as you compare sources to make sure things make sense. Uh, knowledge of human nature, the facts that you already have. Again, you know a few things about what it is you're researching, even coming into it. So do things fit and make sense to what you know? Um, and ultimately, the compilation of all the information you find can, can really tell us quite, quite a lot about how folks have experienced um, the world, how folks have lived in place and, and affected property uh, through time. If you are interested uh, in making an appointment for our research center, we are bringing folks back on site. We are doing appointments uh, in a limited uh, limited hours, Wednesday mornings and Friday mornings. Uh, we also do offer remote research services. Uh, so that's send us an email. We'll try and, and see what we've got and follow up with you from there. I have a great team of researchers, uh, research volunteers who do most of the heavy lifting there. Uh, I am the junior in that crowd. Uh, our research team among them, I think, have a combined 60 years of experience living and researching in Waukesha. Uh, any one of them doesn't have that, but I've got a couple of folks who've been working and, and researching Waukesha history for 15 plus years uh, who are there to help out. Uh, so incredible resources. Uh, the direct email address for them is there, waukeshamuseum at gmail.com. We made it easy to get a hold of us through that Gmail account uh, and it's shared. So you might hear from one or all of our research folks. Uh, we really do look to see, okay, who's got the best skill set for your request and we'll we'll tap you into them. Uh, and we do work very collaboratively, collaboratively with you and with each other um, because it can be hard to look at things on your own. So we, we wanna help support you however we can. So with that, I want to thank you all for tuning in here this evening. Again, if you've got questions, drop them in the chat. Would the Waukesha Register of Deeds have paperwork? Yes, they should, is my short answer. So the question is, would the Waukesha Register of Deeds have paperwork on transfer of properties between two parties with the date and price, et cetera? yes to the register of deeds and funny enough that is july's we're going to be talking more about the register of deeds because there is a lot to be found they do have an online portal um i am still learning how to use that portal i i reached out i want to try and yet connect with somebody either from their staff um the uh for us the end of that question or the waukesha historic society that's us we do not have that information uh we do have some tax assessment information but that is limited uh, our collection is comprised entirely by donation. Uh, so that means it is at will that anything is transferred into our collection. Uh, Waukesha County is small enough that there is no, uh, in terms of, of records, like you mentioned, uh, property sales or transfer property records, do not come to us. Uh, they are either held by the Register of Deeds or uh, transferred over to the State Historic Society as the official repository. Uh, that said, I do have some tax records that are our municipal records. We hold them incidentally. They happily live with us. I talk to the uh, records librarian from State Historic Society about once a year to make sure that we're still keeping them well uh, and accessible. And he says, cool, don't transfer them to me. I don't have space. And I say, OK, I will keep them. So it's a bit more formal than that. Uh, but yeah, definitely tune in for July talking uh, about resources at Register of Deeds. Again, they do have a website and there is a lot of, of information that you can find on their website, but it is not the most intuitive. So we'll do a little bit like we did this evening, uh, try and pull it up and poke around a little bit so that you've got some sense of navigation getting into that site uh, as well. And I am an outside user like all of you, uh, despite our name, we are uh, an independent organization. Uh, so that's the other reason that we, we look to partner so often. And, and to really highlight resources in all of the locations that they live. Uh, it's not just one of us who does the work, it's all of us who get to do the work. So 
Any other questions? Oh, you're very welcome. Gladly done. Thank you all for joining.